I'm a fourth generation shellfish farmer. We're kind of on the North Oregon coast here. Uh, if you like shellfish, uh, the shellfish coming out of knee tarts are as good as anything you're gonna buy anywhere. What this hatchery does is it raises shellfish larvae. You're filling tanks all the time, you're heating tanks. You're raising either baby oysters, baby clams, baby mussels uh, for the shellfish industry. So the water for the hatchery is uh, just pulled simply out of uh, Neatart's Bay here. The water is pumped in 24-7. Uh, we never stop pumping water until we shut down. So right here, what looks like, I'd say medium roast coffee ground, uh, that's larvae. You can see the larvae are kind of swimming around here, but that's, as they sit here, they settle down. We capture them just before they are ready to set, and we ship them out to the farmers. In 2007, we were in a, in a serious situation. Larvae were dying, they weren't growing. Uh, it was like they hit the wall, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. My wife, Sue, had 30 years experience in the hatchery business, and she had a deep sense that something was seriously wrong. What we found out was is that we had a problem with the pH in the ocean. The most fundamental aspect of ocean acidification, which is that higher CO2 in the atmosphere leads to higher CO2 in the ocean, that causes this cascade of chemical effects within the waters. It's pretty noisy in here. Well, this is what we affectionately call the percolator. Uh, Burke Hales is the one that developed this monitoring equipment. One of the things we particularly look at is the pH over here. This is the incoming pH right now. It says it's 7.93, 7.94. In our world, if the pH gets much below 8, um, larvae kind of start stalling out. They don't eat. They just, they're just not having a good day. But we saw situations where we would come in here and larvae would literally dissolve. You, you know how much you put in that tank just simply because you measure them before you put them in. But when you come back two days later to drop the tank to change the water and they're not there, where'd they go? I mean, they would literally dissolve sometimes. We, uh, we had basically zero production. What appears to be happening is that the process of building the initial shell becomes so much more energetically demanding in that early, early life stage that they can't develop their organs for swimming, for catching food. And, and, and our modern day uh, atmospheric CO2 is now 400 parts per million. And the natural variability in the bay at Etards is such that during the summer, only about half of the time are conditions favorable for shell formation. As the atmospheric CO2 rises, the ocean CO2 rises, and what we're seeing is that that we're sort of at this threshold of, you know, make it or break it 50-50 right now, and as things sort of creep further and further away, the favorable windows are gonna become narrower and less uh, persistent and less frequent. The thing that always was in the back of my mind is, is when we were struggling trying to produce larvae is I knew that there were families of shellfish farmers that have been in business for generations and were very uh, depending on us to try to figure this out because they don't get the seed, they're done. We've, uh, we've gone to buffering. We can actually manipulate the, uh, the pH of the water. Over here we have just a fresh water tank and we got soda ash in it. And injects it in at a small amount at a time and keeps that pH right where it's supposed to be. You see it's 8.25 and this is, so we bring it up from 7.93 to 8.25. Uh, it's not an easy, easy fix. Um, just because we can grow a shellfish larvae in this hatchery right now doesn't mean we're fixing the ocean. Um, we're just, we've just proven that, you know, you can manipulate the water to a point where you can still stay in business. You know, what, what's the water gonna be like in 10 years? We don't really know for sure. 
We're just trying to stay you know, one step ahead of it right now.